I'd like to welcome Mark. He's going to talk about type class survival. Uh, hi, my name is Mark Canlis, and I am a Scala engineer at the newly formed Disney Streaming Services based out in New York. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, type classes. Uh, and just to get it out of the way, we are hiring, uh, looking to backfill half of our positions. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so type classes. Um, th this guide is sort of aimed at, uh, we heard it earlier today, like what is the guide that you wanted to see when you were learning this? And all this stuff I learned in the past year, um, and it can be quite intimidating. Um, type classes are like interfaces uh, for functional programming, um, but they're not a mechanism that's native to Scala. Uh, so that might impede some of the learning. Um, and the way to get them uh, into your code base is to use libraries like cats in Scala Z. Uh, but they originate from Haskell, and the more you push on FP culture, the more you'll find people mention Haskell. So there it is. Um, so in the wild, if you're looking at code and you want to know, oh, am I working with type classes, it would generally look like one of these two ways. Um, in the first example, you see this uh, context, semi-group, that's attached to the A parameter. Uh, and then it's, uh, the instance is resummoned using the uh, companion object, or you could, uh, anonymously, or you can give it a name, like in the second example. Um, and you would say you would require semi-group uh, support over type A. Uh, but just remember that not all uh, implicit parameters are type class instances. So here are some examples of uh, type classes and their instances. You might have a semigroup over ints or a monoid over strings. And you can also have higher kinded um, types in the semigroup, uh, in, the, in the type class. So functor over option, which works for all options, like option of int or option of string. Um, so type classes. They likely originate from library authors. Uh, I've, I've gotten questions about like, oh, when do I write my type class? And I would say it's unusual for you as an application developer to write new type classes unless you are writing another generic library for other people to use. Um, so in that regard, you, you, you know, taking cats and Scala Z, you get pushed a lot of these type classes and I feel like it can be overwhelming. Here's a uh, like a word cloud of all the things that you could possibly learn from cats and other things that I couldn't like parse out. Um, so we're going to focus on just five of these and two hierarchies that will help you narrow down like the most popular type classes you've seen. And honestly, you've seen so many of them in the past two days. Uh, so maybe you already know this. <clears throat> and we're going we're gonna to leverage something that um, you should be comfortable with, um, like a subtype relationship, right? We'd say, uh, all mice are animals in this visual example. So the first hierarchy that we're going to learn is semi-group and monoid. So from here we can already glean a, a, a bit of information that all monoids will support whatever was given to them by semi-group. Um, and you can tell that you're working with uh, semi-groups and monoids if you're in a big data context or you see some sort of function signature that looks like Two, given two A's, give me another A. It's just like smashing them together. Um, so first, semigroup. Uh, here's um, a method that's given uh, off of semigroup instances, and uh, there's a framework called Simulacrum that allows you to use uh, symbolic operators as aliases for these methods. So you can either call combined or this weird plus operator. Uh, and like I said, like sometimes people say it's like combining two piles of sand. Um, and here's, here's semi-groups in action. It, it might look a bit tame at the top. It's just, oh, how to add two ints, how to add two doubles. Uh, but what I think is really cool is derived semi-groups for a tuple. Uh, if if uh, your code base knows how to add the left and the right sides, it can add a tuple of, of that, which is pretty cool, uh, especially if you're doing big data. And the best one by far, which I've used so many times, is uh, combining maps. I don't know how many of you have written your own map merge function, but there's no need. You should just use uh, semigroup uh, over map, which is derived. It's great. And the second one in the hierarchy is a, a monoid. And uh, as we've heard, it has a, some sort of, some concept of emptiness. 
And uh, the best example I could find for this outside of a, a big data framework doing this for you is uh, folding. This is straight out of the wonderful CATS documentation. Uh, if you want to fold over a list and sum them together, you need to support a, an empty case. Uh, so if something is monoidal, then it, it will work for an empty list. And here are the two uh, type classes in this hierarchy sort of stacked together in a table. So pretty easy. Uh, the next hierarchy uh, is these three, functor, applicative, and monad. So same, same intuition that we've had before. Every time you have something that is a monad, it is also an applicative, is also a functor, and it supports all the behaviors going up at the top. And you know that you're working with um, one of these if you start working with code that looks like this, f of a, right? It's a value a wrapped in some context f. So first we have a uh, functor. And um, its primary method is anything that can be mapped over, right? Uh, something where you want to change the inner type a to b, but you don't want to affect whatever f is. Uh, and you've done this tons. Uh, so here are some examples. Uh, options, lists, uh, either might be one that you don't know yet, but you'll soon learn <laughs> if you use more cats and Scala Z. Uh, for each of these examples, we're always changing what's on the inside, but we're never changing what's on the outside. Um, and I think the most transformative use of functors for me that's not uh, as intuitive is this concept of decoding and encoding. So if you ever work with play, Akka or Doobie, you'll see this pattern a lot. You want to start with raw data and then sort of pull out the, the good bits and it turns into like a tuple or a record. Or you're doing the opposite. You have a, a tuple or a record and you want to shove it into a database. I think the thing that I've, um, I've seen missing in people's code bases is not taking advantage of functors. And what you can do is sort of attach um, like parsing and decorating on these pipelines so that you don't need to deal with just tuples. You want to go, you want to jump straight to your domain class as soon as possible so that your code is as concise as possible. Uh, the next is applicative. Um, honestly, this is the one that's the hardest to explain, uh, so I won't try. <laughs> um, but it, it gives you two methods. Uh, it gives you this operator that I've never seen in the wild. Um, but it's the first time that values start to interact with one another. And uh, one, one place where it comes up is when you have uh, multiple maybes and you want to construct an object and inherit that, that maybeness, right? Uh, maybe I have a name, maybe I have an age, maybe I can get you a person. And the person constructor does not need to know anything about not having those values available. Uh, and this is powered by uh, an option instance for applicative. Uh, and the more um, powerful version of this, and you've heard it mentioned today, is a, a validated uh, data class in CATS, which does the same thing. It just has a nicer error channel on it. <clears throat> and the last one in the hierarchy is uh, the monad. Um, uh, and it has this uh, <clears throat> weird operator that maybe you have or haven't seen. Uh, flat map exists in Scala, but this symbolic alias does not. Uh, and both cats and Scala Z do have it. Um, and it's the first time that you start to sequence effects. Uh, and also, the inner function can influence what happens to that f, right? If we look at the signature, it's a to f of b. Uh, so that function can choose whether or not to copy, ignore, or rewrite what f is. And places you would see monads, I think, are any time you would want to uh, write like a multi-line for comprehension. Uh, and you would know that you have to, they'd all have to be the same type, right? These are either all options, all lists, all tries, or all either's, or all IOs. Um, so that is, that is powered by flat map and ultimately powered by the, the monadic instance. Um, but re really, the, the, if you've ever seen code <laughs> actually on the bottom that uses a symbolic operator, it took me a long time to understand like why does code look this way. It's actually equivalent to what's on the top. If you start to thread values through step one, step two, step three, uh, you can sort of elide them if you use that operator. So if you can see, that's a, there's a slight difference between this one and the one before it. So in, the one, in this example, the values aren't sort of interacting with each other. It's only interacting in the last step. But in this one, we're making it quite explicit that 
these events have to happen in a sequence because they're dependent on one another. Uh, so there is the second hierarchy uh, in a table. And here's the, the crux of the whole presentation. Um, everything you need to know about the most popular type classes uh, in an easy to remember uh, visual aid. Uh, and if you push hard, um, there is this diagram of like all the type classes in cats. If you like wanted to research like, oh, like where can I go with this? What, what other stuff did he not mention? Um, and shout out to Rob Norris, I believe, for making this. Um, and that's about it. Um, here's some further reading. Uh, I was motivated for this talk by uh, this uh, bestiary article that sort of listed out these different type classes in tabular format, and obviously that, that cat's diagram. Uh, and also a shout out to Michael Pilquist for Simulacrum, which gives you those cool uh, operators, among other things. And uh, the Scholar with Cats uh, intro by underscore is a great intro to type classes and cats in general. So that's it. Thanks, Mark. We have some time for questions. You had mentioned that implicits, uh, let me step back. You mentioned that for implicits, they won't always be type class instances. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that right or wrong or subjective to basically use an implicit for not a type class? Yeah, I, I, I think it's subjective. I'm in the camp of like tools have their good sides and, and bad sides and not too terribly um, opinionated on that. I think the shame is when people confuse the two, so we don't know if something is supposed to be a type class or is it just supposed to be some in-house mechanism that we're using, that we're threading through implicitly. Um, I think it'd be nice if there was some more first class uh, mechanism uh, to make that more clear, but I don't know if it's worth the, the baggage. So I don't, I don't really have a strong opinion about what way it should be, but it is, it is a pitfall for learning, for sure. Any other questions? All right, we'll have a five minute break and then we have one more lightning talk.